everybody. Uh, my name's Ted. I've been a creative director for about 20 something years uh, on different teams like Disney, PlayStation, Sony, Mattel, Lego, Warner Brothers Discovery. But if we really get into it, I've done two tours of duty at Mattel, three tours at Disney. There's random projects from the US Army to NASCAR to the NFL. And you've never really lived until you've had a gun drawn in a meeting at Weed Maps. Interesting story. Buy me a beer. I'll tell you it sometime. Uh, but really, this is better. Uh, I'm more like a railroad traveling freelance creative director with my knapsack and dog with a spotted eye, with my little backpack of ideas. Uh, and here's my disclaimers. Uh, I've been pounding coffee all morning. Kind of nervous. Actually, no, I am nervous. My hands are like really sweaty. I talk fast. I may repeat myself. And I'm not so much a self-proclaimed expert as much as I've just seen a lot. I'm not better than anyone else. I'm just a grinder and a journeyman just chipping away at this stuff. It's a long career. And then, okay, that's me with my sweet Tony Hawk haircut and Snoop Dogg uh, growing up in downtown Long Beach. Why am I showing you this? Uh, one, to give historical context about where my career started. And two, I have no qualms about sharing my age, 52, because I universally reject ageism that subtly shows up in marketing, creative, entertainment, advertising, media, because this is a career path with a slow accumulation of experience. Just like an oncologist doesn't peak at 38, neither does a creative. Also, this is a career that is a jungle gym. It is not a ladder. Things go up and down and back and forth and side to side, and that's okay. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, the importance of positive brand experiences, how to properly invest in your brand when it isn't a clear ROI, creating winning brand experiences, framework tips and insights, and ultimately using a play experience to get more people to buy your stuff. Uh, let's kick this off. The first game we learned taught us to smile. Peekaboo. A game of trust in which we hoped what loves us comes back. The impact of play is that it's how we learned how to learn. Some of us became the kid that grew up who learned how to work but forgot how to play. When we remember to play, we remember to repair what's broken. Play becomes the token we slip into ourselves so that even on the bad days we may continue. It gets us through all the closed doors upon which we once knocked. Play gives us the keys to our happiness. Achievement unlocked. Okay, I like that because it sets the stage. So really, this is about play and the science of play and how it can spread into your work and product. Play is the difference between successful global or successful digital marketing and products versus digital that struggles to perform. So for brands, that means creating products and platforms and experiential projects that consumers find rewarding and actually enjoy using. Uh, this isn't so much a checklist presentation, but rather a philosophical inspirational paradigm shift. And this isn't necessarily about gamification as that feels a little bit worn, like uh, the Zynga Farmville freemium model that's burned us all out. That's a grinding mechanism that creates dissonance in the user. This is more about creating an emotional response. And really what we're in for here is this is about commercial art with an emphasis on big C, little a, meaning we're in this game of, sorry for the slow load, art for money. As my design teacher said, if you wanna make art, go work in the post office and do it on your own time. Uh, this is really about getting asses in seats because the only thing that matters is driving adoption and driving engagement, getting people to buy stuff business. We're in the eyeball business. For me, a giant win is to get people to have a second look because there's so much visual noise out there. If your creative can get a second look, that's a giant win. So creative for the sake, like I was saying, is it's great, awesome, but creative that can move the needle is priceless. Everything around us is built by someone creative. This shirt, the monitor you're watching this on, the light fixture, it's all built with creative in mind. The rub is, is that it can be easily commodified and or opinionated. I may like something, you may not. Who's right, who's wrong? So when we get into this theory of play, play equals happiness. And with that happiness, that means there's more engagement. And when there's more engagement, that means that there are higher emotional moments. Wow, really slow. Ultimately, that leads to an authentic connection. 
There we go. So let's start in the beginning. In ye olden days, at one point in America, we used to go to the well, till the soil. A majority of the U.S. had physical labor. This took away adrenaline. It's too much adrenaline creates anxiety and depression. So that was good. And back in super old days, in caveman times, we used to hunt saber-toothed tigers. And that elicited an adrenaline-filled response. And then when you attacked it and you killed it or it attacked you, you dumped it. Now, we haven't evolved that much. So a strongly worded email can still trigger that adrenaline dump. We haven't evolved too terribly much. And we've also engineered physicality right out of our lives. We go to the gym and have everything quantified and qualified down to the calorie and time spent. Whereas a time we used to play outside in a free and untethered way. There was no storyline. We were the storyline because we were seeking play innately. Uh, this is Scott McCloud's The History of Comics. Highly recommend it. But he says it right here. We see ourselves in everything. A light socket has a face. A pencil is a rocket ship. A piece of paper folded up into a triangle is a football. Imaginative play. Now, graphics and interactions and stories are made up by people or people like me or people like you. The thinking's already done. You're just along for the ride. It's so incredibly well rendered and we're not even going to get into AI. I mean, this is how far we've come from that weird nightmare fuel of Polar Express, the uncanny valley. Uh, things are just so hyper realized now. Uh, that might not be necessarily a good thing. And, and right now, and these are pre-COVID numbers, we're spending 40, 144 minutes every day on screens. That's 7.4 hours. I would actually juice those stats and put it at about like 10 hours a day. So that's including watching TV, uh, front of a computer, minutes on a smartphone, tablet, et cetera, et cetera. And we've always been in these places, every event that you've been to now, I mean, God, go to the Taylor Swift concert. Everyone's watching a live performance behind the screen right in front of themselves. Uh, you know, that's not me saying, get off your phone. I mean, I used to be old man Simpson shouting at the clouds about this, and especially with COVID, but we really just have to lean into the way the world is now and create and market. Oh, there we go. That's, uh, that's me. You'll see this pop up every once in a while. So, so here's the nuts thing is we're more connected in one day than our grandparents are in their entire lives. I would actually put that at an hour that crazy dichotomy. We're constantly, constantly stimulated. Uh, we're connected and disconnected at the same time. And we have to go and physically scare the crap out of ourselves now. We're pushing for extremes. MMA is the fastest growing sport around. For haunted houses, you have to sign NDAs for. And you can't just go to a turkey trot. We have to get chased by zombies and electroshocked or paintballed. And ultimately though, that's okay. Because really what's happening is we're constantly seeking stimuli. Your body and your mind is always craving something new because it normally wants homeostasis. Homeostasis is where you're trying to find that equilibrium and your body and brain is constantly seeking that out. Case in point would be like if you see someone at the gym that's been going to the same jazzercise class over and over and over again, ultimately their body and their muscle starts to achieve homeostasis, it's not being stimulated anymore. Same thing with your brain. There's a reason why it's called dead end jobs. If you're doing the same repetitive task over and over and over again. So really what we want to do is find novelty and play is about novelty and your brain is seeking that your body's seeking that to get rid of that sameness. Think about like when you're a little kid, the Christmas take like seven years uh, to get to like the night before Christmas was like 17 hours. Now as adults, doesn't it feel like Christmas is literally tomorrow. And did we just have it last month? There's that sameness that happens. So that's where play kicks in. So it's about evoking nostalgia and lowering those emotional barriers. You're going to hear that a lot in the next 40 something minutes because nostalgia is a hell of a drug. It's an emotional experience. Deeper memories are made during more emotional times during those peaks and valleys. So if you're having fun, that's an elevated emotion. You're more susceptible to purchasing something that continues that feeling. So you're at a baseball game, you get a free rally towel. And since you're in a better bit rhythm, socially more into whatever messages are being thrown to you. Case in point, I have a 1988 Dodgers towel sponsored by Shell Gas. Uh, poorly silk screened on there. I still have it. I'll never get rid of it. I still have affinity for Shell Gas, even though they're destroying the environment. So there's that weird dichotomy. You know, but Kurt Gibson blasting a home run, uh, 
that had that emotional response with me and whatever was hitting me at that time, uh, marketing wise, I just latched into because play is that elevated emotion. You're more susceptible to purchasing something that continues that happy feeling. Great example would be, you, know, you go to a concert and you have a great time and you get done with it and you see the merch table and you'll spend outrageous money for a terrible concert t-shirt. It's why Disney's making a mint for people that will buy these awful hats, never wear them outside the park, but they're having such a moment right then and there that they want to keep that going. Uh, because play science has discovered that when we interact with certain types of play, like social, imaginative, or creative play, it changes the makeup of our brains and affects the reward system. Stanford researchers have found that play is as necessary in our lives as food and sex. It's pretty heady stuff. Because what that gets us into is this flow state, the theory of flow, getting customers to not want anything else around them. We call that flow state. And this is the sweet part about it. It's that creamy center right there where the things that you're doing, it's not so hard that it induces anxiety, but it's not so easy that it creates boredom. It's that perfect thing where nothing else is happening around you. And this is why you gravitate towards social and mobile entertainment. Again, these are pre-COVID numbers, 43% games, 26 social media, 10% entertainment. I would juice those stats and I'd, put, I'd flip social media over games at the moment. And really, when you want to engage somebody emotionally and have them as open as possible, bring their walls down, you get them to play. Therapists, parents, coaches, it's a time-tested technique. You lower that bar. So that's me babbling away, but really what it gets down is to is brands need to loosen up. This is super important. The more interesting brand experiences that you have, the more interesting they are and the more that you invest in. So here's some examples. So long time ago, I was a creative director at ABC for Disney. And I was a part of a lunchtime informal running club. So lunchtime, we go run and I used to run with the IP lawyers. These guys were brutal. They were the guys that would go after, uh, they go after anybody here. That makes it, that's better. These guys were the Dothraki and they cut you. Loved them to death. Very nice people, but God help me if you caught them in a courtroom. Here's my fun example. You can play that. Principal Skinner, the happiest place on earth is a registered Disneyland copyright. Well, gentlemen, it's just a small school carnival. And it's heading for a great big lawsuit. You made a big mistake, Skinner. Well. So that's what these guys were like. I know I'm, I'm making light of it, but you know, tough guys. So, so uh, at the time also in the house music, and I found this artist, his name was Pogo, and his whole specialty was taking old Disney animated movies and cutting them up into uh, lo-fi beats and house music. Let's give a listen for like 15 seconds or so. Cool, cool. Uh, so I was on a run and it wasn't like I was narking on it, but I just had to know because this piece had been out there uh, in, in the digital world, uh, in space for a long time, a couple months. And so I was like, hey, you guys know about this? It's pretty rad. Um, how come you guys haven't nuked his house? They go, oh yeah, we know about that. Okay, well, what happened? Well, paradigm shift, new word on hive, we're gonna start loosening up. Not their words I'm paraphrasing, but really what it meant was they started doing collaborations. They're doing collaborations with Shepard Ferry. They're getting uh, interesting artists and designers to chop up their brand and resell them. They weren't being so incredibly, they were loosening up and certainly the collaborations they were doing weren't being disrespectful to the brand, like Walt's not turning over in his grade, but it really did loosen it up and allowed for more positive brand experiences. Uh, case in point, I uh, worked at Lego for a bit, moved to De Denmark, and I'm Danish, by the way. Uh, Lego's great. Staple. Everyone here has Legos. Everyone's played with them. And remember, going back to our boy, Scott McCloud, it was always about imprinting your identity onto their bricks, not crafting the story for you. Uh, but 
the Danes uh, in Lego, they're actually pretty rigid. You know, they only came with seven colors of bricks. Uh, one of my favorite things when I was trying to design theme parks for them, my creative director would always yell at me. Her name is Yanni. She goes, no, Teddy, don't do it like that. The children will cry. Because I was always trying to push stuff, but they were very locked into what they were doing. And they were doing great, though. You know, 60 years of being in, um, being in the black. But then they got into the red because and they started stopped being profitable because they were so rigid and times were changing. They weren't changing with them. Then they had a temperature change, a sea change, and then they got they started to loosen up. And then they allowed their brand to expand. We've all seen the Lego movie, which is a perfect example of celebrating the world of play. And you know, they've done these collaborations. They're super fun, different shapes. Gangbusters, really good job there. Uh, other ways of failing could be this was a, uh, a fountain that I worked on for California Misadventure. I call it Misadventure because why would you build a theme park in California about California? But that's a different theme, uh, a different story. So this is why brand experiences matter. This thing was supposed to be uh, it's supposed to spin on access. There was going to be water cannons you shoot at it, and then that would create wind chimes and noises and have these effects. But because this was a different time, uh, Disney used to have a way where if you had a good idea, they'd throw money at it until uh, the idea was built out. They also were very, uh, very keen on having proprietary, uh, proprietary patents, all the machinery they built themselves, everything was built in house. This was the first park where they were on a strict budget and they actually went to like Bob's Roller Coasters R Us and bought roller coasters off the shelf. So this thing got scrapped and just turned into a standard fountain. The rub is, the rub is, that maybe we should have thought about what the sun was gonna be like in August and September in Anaheim. So when you walk into the park, and this is one of the first thing you see, the real sun hits this sun, that beams back onto the water, which beams back onto people's faces. So the first brand experience that they have is melting their faces. Not really great. This thing got bulldozed. I don't feel too terribly sad about that. Uh, if you walk across the street, though, to the other park, this is called a Kugel Ball. I'm not necessarily sure it still exists. It was in Tomorrowland. Uh, Kugel Ball is a big, giant stone. It has this little thin sheen of water on it. So even the smallest of kid, if you start spinning it, it'll spin on its axis and kick off water. Uh, this turned out one of the most, if not the most, traveled section of the park. Uh, you're surrounded by an entire park of technology and wonderment. And this is it. This is the thing where people are going all the time. Thank goodness that there was a store not 10 feet away from it. Uh, funny story. So you got these kids right here on the side and they're spinning. It. Well, on the other side, at one point, this woman, she uh, it was changing her baby's diaper. And so when she got done, she was holding the wet, the, the baby's butt up to it like a wet dry sander. Found out about that. We put more chlorine there. You could smell the chlorine from Frontierland. Uh, anyways, fun stuff. So here's another thing, too, if we're going to beat this uh, theme park idea into the ground. On screen left, that's Autopia. And you can see those giant bumpers there on the front and back. You can, see, you can only move back and forth four and aft by about six to seven inches. Really couldn't do much except go forward. And people would get a little frustrated, and then they create whiplash and crash into people. Case in point, if you have your own storyline, that's Lego Land, uh, well-defined, free play, untethered. Uh, they could do whatever they wanted, and if they did it right, then they could get driver's license, which they would keep forever. And then, of course, there was a, a fantastic store right next to them, so they keep that happy feeling going. So then we have, uh, well, my theme here is choice. Open world gameplay is huge. Brands are inserting themselves in these moments like Fortnite. Just play this for a little bit. No, please, no. So it's this open world gameplay is super huge because then you can create your own storylines. Uh, and then there are obviously brands that are inserting themselves into that. Fortnite is just killing it. Uh, now you can lean too far into play. More play doesn't make for a better experience. Uh, this is during my time at Mattel, uh, worked on this thing called Ogmodo. Uh, it was a track 
where you know you just standard track you put the car in it races goes over the hoops or the loops and then what happened though is we wanted to have uh, trying to lean into that digital experience is we wanted to have a second screen experience so as you're playing with this thing you would hold up your ipad or your app uh, or your mobile phone and you could see these ar effects on top of it or if the car came off the track and you want to get back onto it you would have an, a, a little mini game to let it go again I took it to user testing so we're sitting behind one-way glass watching kids and moms experience this thing and to a person they pretty much hated this thing but to rip off uh, you know they didn't know if they're supposed to look at the screen or if they're supposed to look at the actual analog part of it so the rub is is that uh, you know, if I'm going to quote Jurassic Park, we were so thrilled that we could do this. We didn't think that maybe we should do this. Didn't really go over that well. Uh, now, this one's interesting in that play can sell anything, even like war. So this is circa 2005 for the U.S. Army. Uh, we're fighting a two front war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Army's down recruits. Well, for obvious reasons, but also it's perceived as the least proficient of the formed R branches due to movies like We're in the Army Now with Polly Shore, Stripes with Bill Murray, uh, Gomer Pyle, MASH, et cetera, et cetera. It was per perceived as a bunch of bumbling people when really it's actually the most technically or technically proficient. And it does the thing that America is really exceptional at doing, which is delivering overwhelming destructive capability to anywhere in the world at any time. That was due to the Army. So if they're the most technically proficient, no one knows about that. Where do you go and how do you get wayward young men to sign up? So at the time, NASCAR was super huge. And so we would set up these events where we'd have these life-size real Humvees, six of them. And then you would have six people in a Humvee with these real weapons that were cored out with infrared. And there'd be these concave video game screens. And all everyone would at the same time, each of these Humvees be driving through Islamabad uh, blowing away anything that moves on a rescue mission. We had on these, uh, underneath these uh, Humvees, we had bicycle chains whipping around. So, you know, feels like bullets are hitting it. Air puffers, so it felt like air or, you know, bullets are going past your head. Uh, smell pods, uh, so it smelled like lamb, BO, cordite, gunpowder. You know, the more senses that are engaged, the more memorable the experience. We also had RFID tracking chips, so you could see your score. Now, they didn't need old dudes like me, but they did want young Billy. So we had this charming ex-Special Forces son of a bitch that was just really charming guy. And he would call Billy from the herd and he'd say, hey, saw you rocking the M60 there. How you feel about a job in the Army? Then uh, they would get a real and actionable metric, i.e. a real phone number, a real email address. And then a couple of weeks later, the recruiter would follow up on that. Uh, it was very effective. And I do have misgivings. I do have thoughts about this in, in retroactively. But if we're talking about insidiousness, at least the Army project was head on. Whereas TikTok has superb gamification, dopamine microdosing. Uh, its gameplay is unparalleled. Its play is unparalleled. And one of the biggest controversies surrounding TikTok is the influence of its parent company, a Chinese tech giant called ByteDance. And given the close relationship between the Chinese government and the businesses operating within the country, TikTok is used now as a tool for the Chinese government. So that's pretty tough. This editorial was brought to you by Grandpa Simpson. Uh, if we're talking about gameplay we're going and play science, we're going across the spectrum here. Now, it can also get you to buy more things. Uh, we all have our preset routes. We go into the store, we go into a Target, you go to the produce and you go to the meat place and then you go here and you go there and you just want to get out of there. So for Target, they wanted to get people to go deeper into the store and purchase more. So we created a game that encouraged shoppers to explore the entire store, giving them deep discounts. Pretty effective. Play can also take the boring and the mundane and make it fun and, and engaging. Uh, San Francisco, that's a, that's a BR headset. So city controllers and city planners, arguably some pretty boring jobs. You put that on, you can walk through a Godzilla-sized real-time San Francisco. So, and you could activate EMS. You could turn on stop lights and stop sign, or yeah, stop signs, lights. So it's like this. So you're Godzilla essentially walking through in the real time, moving fire trucks and things to destinations, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, Nike, weaponized play, made a delightful brand experience, rewarded consumers for doing the very thing that we should be doing innately, which is playing. 
57% profitability is no joke there. Uh, liquid death, God bless these guys. They made water super fun. Uh, I'm hyper, just in awe of their marketing creative teams. Their the ability, they've taken something that is just this, it's water and made it into uh, a cultural phenomenon. Just hyper, hyper impressed with them. Going even now into your streaming services, uh, Netflix opened up their engagement and subs by catering to individual tastes. It used to be one size fits all. Studios would make one piece of key art, uh, let's say for a movie or a show, let's call it Friends. Take this really great piece of key art. Uh, they uh, shoot it, looks designed well, then they shove it on a giant outdoor billboard. Then they take that same piece of art and they cram it into a bus kiosk. And then they take that and they shove it into a magazine. And they take that and finally you go into your productized experience and go into the web uh, or go onto your streamer service. And then it would look terrible. Uh, and also what I may find really appealing, you may find repellent, even though we might like the same show. So what they did is they loosened up the reins and made bespoke art for each cohort, testing to see, see which one was more appealing. More engagement means more time on service, which equals more value for the subscription. I always like this slide because we would look at this and see what worked. Uh, and we'd put bets on which art was going to be the highest performer. Now, if we're going into, uh, this is the ultimate play device, Tinder. Like, talk about heightened emotion inserting your brand. It's the ultimate Pandora's box or what's behind the door, the tiger or the prince or the princess. Fantastic. Keep going, too, with super high emotional touch points. Uh, escape rooms are dynamite places because you're in that heightened experience. It's right up there with like roller coasters and horror movies for great first dates because you're in this hyper, hyper uh, emotional ability, hyper emotional awareness it makes you more susceptible. Then we get into esports. only eight to 12 people on stage, 1.4 billion though are going to engage in that environment. And you get the same emotional response as one would get in a football game. And probably more so because there's a belief that you could actually be a part of that. Coke is doing a fantastic job of taking over those venues, using those high emotional moments to insert their brand. But, but if you want to play this just for a second or so. So this isn't necessarily about a $5 billion sphere or event. It's about finding the small moments that you can tweak on its ear, the small details. Uh, you know, if we had $5 billion, we could do anything. It's really not so much about that. A one day takeover, this is like half a million dollars in a one week run is like almost a whole million dollars. It's nuts. It's not about that necessarily. So here's some counterpoints. Uh, why not, why play and not gamification? Because Gamification is a tactical experience. So if you're going to gamify something, it suggests that they're already engaged with it. Play is a psychological and emotional tie because while you're getting, while you're getting people to play, they're already having fun. They're not stressed. They're not bored. So they're willing to take risks. All right. So who are these people anyways? Is it showing up? Well, here we go. All right. It is digital entertainment junkies. And who we call them DEJs, or I call them that, so so to speak. So, hundred. This is more a video game slide than I've got. You know what? I'm going to skip this slide. This is this is boring. You guys don't need stats. Here's what it is. They inhibit these four qualities: four tech thinking. They're entertainment seekers. They're highly engaged. They're influential. Uh, innovation enthusiasts, status seekers. I'm uh, sure their entertainment is spent on screen and blah, blah, blah. Here's the thing. Uh, who cares about this stuff? What it really is, is please load. Uh, people are willing to spend money on digital content and games that they want. Use technology as a way to make a style statement about who they are and influence the buying behavior of the people that they know. So what it really gets down to is that us, all of us here on this, me, you guys, we're leading this charge. We're the tastemakers. So when you're developing a concept, designs, et cetera, make it for you first. Obviously you're designing and creating from a brief and consumer research is always gonna be your trusted partner. Those are your best friends, the people in consumer research. 
But when you get into those tiny decisions, those little details and pieces of flair that can turn something from meh into something really clever, go with your gut. And there is a thing called intuition and we use it every day. We use it when we drive our cars. We don't test uh, user test every left turn that we do. And we don't want to be like Google and test 256 shades of blue for the O in the Google logo. You don't have to focus group your ideas to death. Do it within reason. Uh, so if you guys at this point, if you're still sticking in with me, I really appreciate it. This is fun and all. What's in it for you, or rather what's in it for me? How do I get to create these brand experiences? How do I get someone to buy into my idea when there isn't clear ROI? Because that is true about a lot of these examples. It's not performance marketing where there's always actionable metrics that you can pull from a data sheet. So what do you do if you're working at a company? Get with the sales team. Sales team, oh, I love this. Every time I show up at a new company, get in tight with IT and the salespeople. They are the backbone of the company. No sales equals no jobs. They have pull within the company so they can help influence your, your audience. And this isn't going rogue. It's really basically following the Zig Ziglar adage. You can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people what they get what they want in life. So they're always dying to have people help you or getting people to help them with a deck, ideas, something that they could bring out to a sponsor or sale. Uh, they're really great. I love the salespeople. There's notes here that say a Big Daddy King quote that says, romance with no finance is a damn nuisance. I don't know why that's here, but that has to do something with the sales team. Anyway, uh, marketing is your friend too. Uh, the issues are that sometimes marketing creative teams have traditionally been at odds with each other. In my own experience at bigger media companies, your mileage may vary. The most cliche example being marketing saying essentially, oh, just make it pretty as if the creative team is just a bunch of design school kids who don't have higher strategic reasoning. While on the other side, you get a bunch of prima donna creatives chafing at the marketing associate who wants to make it blue because she likes the color blue. So there's this sometimes this inherent fight the most perfect world is that marketing supplies the brief, gets out of the way, and lets the creative team swing away using the bullet point, uh, bulletproof and perfect brief that the marketing teams created like gospel. When that works, when you're equal partners, you're going to crush it. The advice here is to build that trust between the two teams. And this is where EQ comes in. EQ, not IQ. EQ is emotional intelligence. So I'm not really that smart, but my EQ is pretty decent. So it's salesmanship. And I recommend that to every creative is to get that salesmanship. Uh, case in point is a favorite phrase of mine is ask for a snake, get a puppy. Little kid goes to mom and says, mom, mom, I really want a snake. She goes, no, oh God, no. Well, how about a puppy? So, oh, that's no problem. We'll get the puppy. So sometimes it means push ideas really super far out there, knowing that your least viable product that's the thing that you actually want, and you'll be comfortable for that. I liken it to like what the creators from South Park do uh, with censorship. Every single script, they blow it out the doors. They just make it the most profane thing uh, ever. And then when the censors come back, they only chop like two thirds of what they wanted to keep anyway. So it's great. Uh, another thing though, is that Western companies are top down driven, meaning the info comes down. Whether you're Zaslav or Steve Jobs or Iger, or Elon Musk, you say, we're gonna do a thing. And from middle management all the way down to the guy that parks cars, they go, aye, aye, captain. And that's how it goes. So you kind of get siloed up and you have to stay in your silo. So unless you can pull off some bridge building with the other teams and of course the sales team, sometimes you have to work within those constraints. Or, or there's bottom-up decision-making. Uh, learn this in Tokyo for Sony. So. That's really great. So although decision-making in Japan, Japanese companies is bottom up, the power of the typical Japanese CEO is so great that no important decision can actually be made without first considering his or her wishes. So what that means is I call it the upwelling or centrifuge. Let's, so there's me. So I've got a great idea. I really want to see this thing through. I talk to another ally, another friend, pitch them on the idea, get their, get them enthusiastic about it. Then the two of us, we talk to four people and the four of us talk to eight and the eight talk to 16, the 16, the 32. So by the time you actually get to talk to the big, the big boss and you actually get to pitch something, you've got this armada of people who are already bought into the idea. So when you say, we really want to do this and he goes, well, have you talked to Hiromi-san? You go, well, Hiromi's right over there. And Hiromi goes, right. 
Well, if you talk to Bob and Bob's over there and Bob says, yeah, we're all in, it just helps with making your leadership look good and making their decision tree really, really easy. It's really, really fun. And although it does take a little bit longer, but it's worth it. And even if you're a B2B company, you're still talking person to person and no one really wants to be bored. So leaving it with, in short, we're designing for ourselves, uh, make your choices fun whenever you can, use these high emotional moments to insert your brand and use play as a foundation to experience everything that you can do. And I'm done. Uh, I feel like Will Ferrell in old school when he was in that debate with James Carville. Uh, anyway, <laughs> here we go. Done. This, this is fascinating. I think we're getting a lot of questions, but first I have a, a question for you, Ted. So I, I mean, I find it fascinating uh, speaking about these binge moments when we look at examples of Tinder, TikTok, Netflix, etc. We see the common thread, I think, is like we're getting people into these gamified experiences where they're spending hours inside a product and mm -hmm. we change the, the way people live their lives, how they meet their partners, et cetera. This is obviously quite a departure, as you said, from like 10, 20 years ago. Do you think we made uh, these changes with the power of brand experiences and how we, we gamified the products? Or do you think marketeers just basically ad adapted to how people already wanted to consume content? It's kind of like a chicken and egg question. Yeah, no, they're, it's going with the, they're adapting to the times around them. Uh, but it does take certain pioneers to get out there and take that first step, uh, do the thing that, you know, that could be construed as outrageous. And then now it's just commonplace. So, yeah, it's just a constant, it's just a constant evolution. But there is a tendency, homeostasis, to try and fall back on what's guaranteed of what works. Because no one wants to get fired for <laughs> pushing a back. So a lot of times in creatives, and you know, these are hard jobs to get, you want to hang on to these jobs. So you don't necessarily want to take these risks. You know, there's a there's a duality there. I like that. And I, I mean, it's totally true. As you say, nobody wants to lose their jobs. And that makes me think of testing. Um, you mentioned Netflix and how they, how you use like different localization and different uh, cohort graphics for the same uh, content. I wonder what's your take on, and I know we briefly touched upon this before, how do you use testing for your advantage, but also make bold decisions and not just like trust in the testing blindly? Oof. Okay, slippery slope. Uh, <laughs> testing's great, God bless. And it works certainly, you can over test. Uh, much like Google, if you type, how you type the question in, could predetermine your answer. And also you can use the results, you know, like anyone can use stats to their own advantage. So you have to be very broad with it. You don't wanna start getting into where it's so pedantic that you're testing every nuance of color on a button, but you certainly wanna go with broad, distinguishable characteristics. Like with performance marketing, what I like to do is create eight different pieces of content, each one wildly different than the next. Uh, and then you test them all. So one could be like a TikTok video, one could be short form narrative, one could just be a graphic, throw it all out there, see what sticks, and then uh, go with that. Unfortunately, more often than not, sometimes it's just the boring graphic that wins, not the really, really interesting uh, Instagram piece that you spend a lot of time shooting. Uh, and then you gotta start all over. Anyone thinks that they've cracked the performance marketing code is lying. It's always you know, what is cool today, whatever TikTok dance trend is happening could be instantly out of date tomorrow. So there's constantly evolution. So in that case, yes, test, test, test. But when it comes to just an initial concept, go light and lively. Don't get too deep into it. I like that. And I like that. the only constant is constant change. Um, I'm going to go to some questions from our audience. So Carly asked, um, I love these ideas and examples, and this feels very engaging for B2C, but I'm curious if this also is applicable to B2B um, SaaS brands that are less fun. And you mentioned something about people. You, you always talk to people. Yeah, uh, I, I gave a little, I gave it a nod at the very last, uh, on the last slide there. But when, yes, B2B is fantastic. And, but just remember, it's still people. 
uh, you're still talking person to person. It's not like you're, you know, you're speaking zeros and ones and some sort of binary code to each other. It's still a person behind, behind that email or behind that business that wants to be engaged. Uh, and I always go back to the Zig Ziglar quote of help them out, you know, do whatever you can to help these people out and then they'll help you out. And that um, works for the B2B in that they're all trying to solve a problem and be that, be that problem solver for them and try and give them really interesting ideas. Uh, sometimes it's more than just an email campaign. No, definitely. Um, next question, Jason asks, um, how have you managed to stay motivated, excited and engaged with the creative industry and take risks as you've grown in your career? Uh, so I call it the one percenter theory. If you have a hundred art school students, uh, ninety-eight percent of them will not make money uh, being creative. That ninety-ninth person will teach most likely, and that hundredth person, that one percenter, actually gets paid to be creative. I'm very fortunate that I've been a one percenter. Uh, most likely, all of you here are as well. Uh, I don't. I, I take that. You know, I used to be a paramedic after nine eleven. I was. I had my own agency, uh, very small advertising agency, and after nine eleven, since I was always uh, an EMT and a beach lifeguard dropped everything and became a paramedic. And while I was still trying to keep my agency going, and there was this moment there where I'm trying to pull someone's chest cavity out of a steering wheel. I'm like, this isn't, things could be, things aren't so bad when you're having a difficult client that wants you to create 20 banner ads uh, that look terrible. This is a pretty fun industry. The hard part is, is that it's easily commodified. It's opinionated. Like I said, this shirt, that light fixture, that monitor, the art behind you, okay? Uh, I may like it, you may not like it. Who's right, who's wrong? And then we've all heard this. Well, my brother's uncle can design a website. Uh, or someone comes up and says, hey, could you just design a little logo for my softball team? It's like, well, okay, can you give me free orthodontia? Like, just because we love to do this doesn't mean that we uh, should be taken advantage of. I don't know if I answered the question, but is, yes, I'm just very grateful. I'm, I'm grateful every time I get paid to get creative. That's really what motivates me. That's yeah. totally the right answer. And I, I do think that it makes sense to keep that perspective. I think we do have amazing jobs. And I do think we sometimes over uh, overdo like the stress and the anxiety because we're maybe so passionate about what we do. It is a very emotional process. At the same time, it's very personal. Um, so I, I do guess people tend to be demotivated. But speaking of uh, everybody kind of chiming in and everybody knowing everything about design, um, it brings me to the next question um, from uh, Jason as well. What are your tips uh, for selling ideas to executive leaders? So you mentioned a bit about this top-down leadership, but how, how do you convince them that um, they should go for what you're proposing? Okay, so... It's, it's tough. You solve their pain points. Again, no CMO wants to get fired. <laughs> I mean, you know, help them with their pain points. You know, it can't just be about your fantastical idea. You have to really look at the brief and see what they want to do. Uh, God, the head of marketing at Warner Brothers, Discovery, when I was there, he had the greatest quote. He wants, give me the ideas that are so outrageous that HR gets involved. Uh, I love that. And I took that apart. You know, let's like swing for the fences. The rub is, is that the person below him, who is my boss's boss, it was hard to get past her because she was more conservative and didn't want to present the more outrageous ideas. So trying to work within that framework of first satisfying your boss and then set, making sure that they look good and then making sure that they, their boss looks good. Cause that's the ultimate thing about our jobs is, uh, I'm here to make my boss look good because he or she needs to make their boss look good. And ergo, we all have jobs. So trying to get it up there is, that's the salesmanship. It's the EQ. It's coming up with as many ideas as possible that satisfy those requirements. And then always having something in your hip pocket that you can pull out. So when he goes, mm, I don't know about that, or says the dreaded, let's take ideas one and two and combine them. Uh, you have an answer for that. Absolutely. So point number one, everybody has a job. Point number two, nobody wants to lose that job. And point number three, 
we all want to do the most crazy thing we can without, again, going to HR and losing our jobs. <laughs> I love that also idea of um, ask for a snake and get a dog because that's mm -hmm. something we forget a lot of times. I mean, we do it all. I do it all the time. You think, well, that's not going to fly. Let's just optimize for success, immediate right. success. And you don't have the courage every single day to ask for the, the snake. But we didn't, do need to remember that's why we're in these roles in the first place. So that's very cool. Um, Chris asks, very interestingly, as a creative soul, if you could do anything every day, career or otherwise, what would you fill your days with? Uh, 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 we're talking, hmm, I guess I would draw, you know, sketching. Uh, mm -hmm. Grew up, I didn't have a TV growing up famously. Uh, my dad threw it away when I was five years old, but in turn, he gave me any comic book and or art supply that I wanted. So I grew up drawing. I didn't, it was tough at school because I didn't know who Mr. T was. Uh, and, all, and then funny because I became a TV executive. Uh, but I would draw. And one day, animation school at Cal Arts would draw all day. Uh, that's all we did. And that was super fun. So if I had, had my druthers and I didn't have to worry about money, uh, I would just travel, go to coffee shops and draw people. That sounds really lovely. And I mean, I guess that's also part of the play, play science. Um, another question here uh, from Cass, how do you draw the line between a new and exciting idea and something that is just too much play? New and exciting and too much play. Yeah, I think that Ogmodo example was a great idea where it was a good example of, you know, it, you know, it wasn't combining chocolate and peanut butter. It, it was like combining chocolate and pickles or something. It was just, it was just, just because there's two things doesn't make it, doesn't make it fantastic. Uh, drawing a line. I don't know. That's a hard question. Uh, really, if it, if it satisfies the metrics, if it satisfies the brief, then you've won. Now, if you can push that a little bit further, great. But if you don't answer the brief, that's the fail. That's where it is. You know, just because you have a great idea and, and, and it's super fun, if it doesn't satisfy the brief, then you failed. That sounds great. And and I guess the answer is there is no such thing as too much play. No, um, not all. <laughs> no, have fun. Life is short. Um, absolutely. Um, another question from Edward. How does the scale of a project impact the design choices made when creating brand experiences? How do you find the most effective strategies for the different size projects? And I think I, I would guess he refers to the fact that a lot of people maybe don't always have the Netflix or the TikTok, you know, to, to invest all their time in. Sometimes you have these small things. How do you interject play into them? Uh, you know, trying to be, find as much uh, lightness uh, you know, talk to people like they're your friend, not your boss, even if it's an email campaign, uh, you know, trying to humanize things. It doesn't mean that you need to go full Wendy's Twitter account on them and be snarky. <laughs> uh, but it does mean that be a human, you know, avoid the exclamation points and uh, the marketing speak as much as I can. A lot of it also is driven by driven by budget. You know, I, I like to think that if I had a billion dollar budget, I would come up with a pretty mediocre idea. Uh, overwhelmed by choice. But if you gave me like a thousand bucks and a tight timeline and a six pack of Diet Coke, I can make that thing sing. The more constraints you have, the more it pushes you to be creative. That's why I'm really interested in uh, whatever next gig I go to. Uh, I really am hoping that you know, there's some, there's a lot of constraints on it actually, because that's really going to push me. It's one thing to have, like I was showing that sphere example from uh, Vegas. Yeah, you could do anything with that thing. Uh, it's great, but what about if you didn't have that? What if you had like it was just a, you know, like I think one of the most creative things I ever did was working for Cisco, trying to get sales guys to enjoy selling routers in space. We created really fun content for that. You know, that sounds like the most boring thing in the world, but if you can take that boring stuff and make it fun, that's a win. That's really that's real creative. Totally. It makes me think like it's it's just about the fact, do, can you say that people are going to talk about it the next day or are we just redoing what everybody has done in the past? Bingo. Um, another very interesting question. Uh, Sandhya asks, um, 
a lot of play experiences tend to be geared to younger audiences. What are some strategies you can use to specifically market play experiences in an engaging way to adults, or obviously uh, older generations? Mm, the olds, that would be me. Uh, <laughs> well, it's nutty because I still feel like I'm, I'm some goofy 18 year old. Uh, you know, there is, there is a nuance there for sure. Uh, you know, it's the difference between going to Coachella or going to Bottle Rocket. Uh, you know, people, adults still, they still want to be perceived not as old or out of it, but they certainly want to have a more refined experience, I think. They want to have more, uh, they want to have, they still want to be catered to. I want to be catered to. Uh, I don't want to feel like I've suddenly become old and obsolete just because I hit a certain, uh, a certain number, even though I have more spending power. So... Really, that's tough. That's a tough question because if it, ultimately, universally, good play, good play experience, good design, that should be a universal truth that everyone can enjoy. Uh, like TikTok is a great example. Uh, everyone can get on board with that. And it has a great UI, UX interface, and it's super, super dopamine inducing. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I'm rambling. Sorry, too much coffee. No, that's exactly what we're here to do, <laughs> just discuss these topics. Um, but no, it's true. I mean, I, I think of Lego, you mentioned them before. It's obviously famously known for being a product for people until 99 years of age. Um, you never stop loving Legos. <laughs> and that, that's a sort of, I guess, atmosphere that everybody needs to, to take from it. Um, I think we have uh, time for one last question. Um, I have a, a question from Celine here um, asking, how important do you think social media is in creating brand experiences that turn our consumers into super fans? And maybe can you give us an example of how we combine like brand product experiences and social media? Uh, I mean, it's mandatory to have a, the ultimate 360 is you go to an experiential event. Um, the more senses are engaged, the more memorable experience. And then that gives you, something to go to or a social shared experience uh, experience that you can go take away uh, i mean it's just it's like breathing i mean you can't do anything <laughs> without some sort of social engagement uh, across the board in fact that's probably that's the least viable product that's the thing that you're going to start with more often than not is that digital experience and then build out from there uh, everything has some sort of social component uh, yeah Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think we have seen probably a lot of overlap in, in the examples you, you shared with us. I definitely right. like TikTok is obviously a very easy one, but even Netflix, right? Like it kind of brings that sort of social media um, atmosphere to everything you do individually. And even like being able to watch with other people is a big component to it. So um, I totally agree. I think the, the social aspect is probably the one key ingredient for all of them. Thank you.